Hey everyone, I'm Ivo Dalder, President of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and thank you all for joining us and especially our members for this Zoom conversation on the, on the geopolitical challenges of our time at a moment of really historic upheaval. And it's wonderful to be joined by Rebecca Listener and Mira Rapp Cooper, who've just written a terrific book on this question, and I'm really looking forward to jump into the conversation. But before we get started, it's a reminder that the Council is an independent and nonpartisan organization. The views expressed by the individuals hosted here are their own, and they do not represent the institutional positions of the Council or indeed of the organizations to which they uh, belong. The program is part of the Lester Crown Center on U.S. Foreign Policy, which was established by a very generous gift from the Crown family to support all of the Center's efforts and the development of digital resources to make the Council's foreign policy content accessible to everyone. Lastly, if you have a question for the panel, uh, we will be taking your questions in about 30 minutes or so. Go to ccga.live in your browser, browser, ask a question there, or vote on a favorite question that you already see. Now, with that said, I'd like to welcome our two guests for the conversation. Rebecca Listener is an assistant professor in strategic and operational research department at the U as Naval War College. Rebecca joins us from Long Island. Wonderful to have you here, Rebecca. So happy to be here, Evo. Thank you. And also with us is co-author Mira Rapp Cooper, who is a senior fellow at the Yale School's Paul Tsai uh, China Center, uh, is at moment on leave as a senior fellow uh, at, at the Council on Foreign Relations and the author of another great book, also released this year, Shields of the Republic, The Triumph and Peril of America's Alliances. Uh, that book, as well as uh, copies of Rebecca and Mir's latest volume, An Open World, How America Can Win the Contest of 21st Century Order, are available for sale from our local Chicago book partner, The Bookseller. We will be circulating the direct link uh, for purchase in the Zoom chat function throughout the program. Uh, Rebecca, Mira, uh, wonderful to have you. Look forward to the discussion. As I said, I think it's a terrific book. Uh, a, a couple of hours read and you just fill it full with uh, good historical analysis and great policy analysis. Uh, Mira, let me start with you because the premise of the book, and in fact, you, you guys talk about this in the preface, is what, what's the world gonna look like after Trump? Uh, we, uh, for those who don't know, we're having an election here in the United States. Uh, and uh, there is in fact, uh, two people on, on, on the ballot and one of them is the incumbent president who might well win. So let me start off with the premise, uh, or taking on the premise, what happens to the world? What happens to international order? What happens to American foreign policy uh, if Trump gets reelected? Well, Evo, first of all, I'll start by thanking you for these generous introductions and for having us. We're really excited to get to connect with the Chicago Council audience and to have this conversation with you as we so respect your work uh, in this field in particular. Um, this question that you just posed, Evo, really animates Rebecca and my book. That is, what would the world look like uh, potentially under a new president and with a new strategy? And how would that differ from the world we might see if Donald Trump was reelected? It's fundamentally, Rebecca and my belief, that there is a battle afoot in the international order between forces that would like to see international order closed off and forces that would like to keep it open. Now, we generally think of the United States and certainly its allies as being on the side of openness. That is, being in favor of political independence, open global commons, and international cooperation. But for the last several years, the United States has aided and abetted, um, and sometimes even participated as an actor in favor of international closure. Um, we can think of this, of course, um, in terms of some of the necessary emergency measures that came to managing uh, the coronavirus crisis, like closing off borders. But we can also think of this um, in terms of unilateral trade policies, efforts to disengage from international agreements, uh, efforts to criticize and potentially even withdraw from U.S. alliances. These are all activities that withdraw the United States role from the world and make it more likely that forces of closure, namely China, uh, who favors a world governed more in line with its preferences, will prevail. 
So it's our fear that in a second Donald Trump term, the world would fundamentally become more closed. The United States would continue to withdraw from to its borders, would continue to pursue unilateral policies that fundamentally weaken, if not cause the collapse of the international order as we know it. And opposition countries, rivals like China, namely, would proceed to fill the void, establishing spheres of influence, whether those are defined in geographic terms or in terms of technology. We see this as a world that's fundamentally more dangerous to the United States, and that's why we're advocating for a strategy of openness. So Rebecca, just to follow up on that, uh, uh, does it matter for the argument of your book and the argument that you want to make, whether, uh, uh, is that going to be as applicable in 2025 as it is in 2021, or do you do see this as sort of a critical a turning point in American foreign policy, where the opportunity at least for we come back, backing an open world still exists, but in 2025, it will become too late. How do you, how do you see that? How true do you see that? Well, the United States today is at the most consequential geopolitical crossroads that we've seen at least since the end of the Cold War and maybe since the end of World War II. Because in the vast destruction that the COVID crisis has wrought, there is also a tremendous moment of opportunity. And the fact is that the US remains a tremendously powerful actor on the global stage, even though we're no longer the world's unrivaled superpower. So if the US can muster the political will to turn this moment of destruction into a moment of creation, there is tremendous opportunity to advance openness and to realize this vision of an open world. And the fact is, as you just pointed out, Evo, Eventually, at least according to our Constitution, there will be a day after Trump, whether he wins in November uh, and then leaves in 2025 or if Biden wins in November and Donald Trump leaves office in January. The question before us is what kind of America and what kind of world will the next president inherit when that day comes? And Mira provided a really compelling overview of the grievous international damage that may occur if the United States doesn't immediately step up and lead as a force for openness over the next four years. But also on the back end of let's say a second Trump term, the United States itself domestically is going to be in a weaker position because the last four years have seen this president stoke tremendous domestic divisions with exacerbate the fissures that are already hobbling the United States and hobbling our foreign policy from within. So it's hard to say where we would be after a second Trump term. Certainly there will still be elements of this strategy that could be put into effect. Certainly there are allies and partners and businesses around the world who have a strong interest in seeing an open world and can sustain parts of this strategy, even if the United States embraces closure. But there is a great urgency to embrace the strategy of openness that our book proposes today, because the moment is now. And especially after this pandemic has really upended geopolitics as we know it, the time is now to seize this opportunity. So uh, uh, let's move from the hypothetical to the bet, back to, to, to the argument. And, and, and a key to the foundational argument, which is consistent with what we just talked about, is that this isn't about Trump per se. It's about larger forces that are happening in the world that were there before Trump and will continue to be there after him. Uh, and that prior administration, uh, not only this one, but others, uh, have not really absorbed the reality of that changing world So, and the forces that came with it. So talk a little bit about those driving forces that existed on November uh, 7th, 2016. The world didn't fundamentally change in that sense uh, and are, have continued, but are driving us to this need to really rethink how we approach the world. It's such an important question, Evo, and fundamentally the reason that Rebecca and I took up this project um, was because of the immediate reaction to Donald Trump's election and the fact that, you know, venerable commentators and policy analysts from both sides of the aisle seem to ascribe to this new president an enormous destructive power. Um, that didn't seem to us to be quite right. Uh, for a long time, we have understood Donald Trump to be more of an avatar 
than an architect for the international change that we are viewing today. And so this project was motivated by the desire to understand the forces that are fundamentally transforming the United States role in the world. We group those forces into two buckets, broadly speaking. They are domestic forces and they are international forces, all of which are transforming the type of foreign policy the United States can have. On the domestic front, perhaps the most important force is the in endemic uh, domestic dysfunction that we have been experiencing that has been accumulating for decades. Now, uh, listeners of this program will be very familiar with the phenomenon of political polarization, uh, but it has some particularly pernicious consequences on foreign policy. The sorting of our polity into opposing blocks or camps, whether we're talking about political leaders, the public, or the media environment, results in a diminution of America's role on the global stage. First, because the United States cannot maintain consistent policies that allow us to send clear signals, whether in international institutions, inside of alliances, or in any other venue. Second, because it encourages irresponsible policymaking, because political leaders know they won't be punished for their missteps. An example is the fact that the United States has woefully under-responded to Russia's intervention in the 2016 elections because the Republican Party knows that it won't be punished for its under-response. Um, and in addition to political polarization, we see technological change as a huge uh, domestic factor that will ultimately determine whether or not the United States remains powerful in the future. But on the world stage, there are forces that are just as consequential, namely power shifts that mean that the United States is no longer in the preponderant global position it enjoyed after the end of the Cold War. The incredibly rapid ascent of China has now created a new major power. But more broadly than that, power continues to diffuse from west to east. And again, technology diffuses along with it, creating technological competition amongst these new rivals. So what we see both at home and abroad is a world of far more U.S. constraint and a world in which the United States fundamentally cannot keep itself safe and secure if it acts alone. And indeed, if it fails to embrace coalitions and multilateralism, a world that is likely to become much more closed. So Rebecca, build on that for a second, because part of the argument is also that the kind of world that we used to have, what we used to call a liberal international order, a rule-based order, uh, but whatever you call it, this, this idea that we build on American leadership, uh, that that world, we can't go back to it, that it's gone forever. And, and, and explain that because I think that will be helpful when we get to the strategy for an open world about how what we're advocating for is different from the strategy that we have. Absolutely. So international orders, it's sort of an academic jargony term, but what it basically refers to are the rules, the laws, and the institutions that govern and organize relationships between states at any given time in international politics. And international orders always reflect the underlying distribution of power that exists in the world. And so when that distribution of power changes, orders tend to change. So the structure that we refer to as the liberal international order was born in many ways in the wake of World War II, especially with the vision put forth by FDR and with the founding of the United Nations, with, which just celebrated its 75th birthday uh, last week at the UN General Assembly. And it had a vision for a types of cooperation that would happen between states for the respect for sovereignty and also foundational norms of non-aggression. But Many of the greatest hopes of the order that was established in the immediate post-World War II era foundered when the Iron Curtain descended and the United States and the Soviet Union coalesced opposing blocs, closing off large portions of Europe to access by American ideas, American diplomacy, American military. But it was really only with the end of the Cold War that the United States saw that, or at least thought that it saw, that it could lead a liberal international order, which is to say a global system that was wholly liberal and sought to export liberal markets and liberal political systems, that was truly international, which is to say universal, and also that was really orderly, which is to say that it would penetrate all forms of international political life. And that liberal international order that did prevail in the post-1991 period had some important successes. It oversaw a period of, generally speaking, considerable peace, considerable prosperity, good public health outcomes prior to the COVID pandemic. Uh, 
But the fact is that it was always predicated on preponderant American power. And as power has shifted in the ways that Mira just discussed, the foundation of that order just simply don't exist anymore. So the aspirations of liberal universalism, this idea that perhaps history had ended and there were no competitors to America's liberal model, that has been quite thoroughly debunked. The world that we live in now, and therefore the order that we will see in the 21st century, is one in which the US and its allies and partners are going to have to live alongside a China that is very powerful, but that has not itself liberalized, even though it arose within a US-led system that had liberal characteristics. So the central imperative for American strategy going forward is to engineer a new strategy, a new idea of foreign policy, and a new concept of international order that is responsive to these changed geopolitical realities. So uh, let's talk about what that new strategy is in relation to first to other alternatives. So we are in the, in the, in, in, in the debate about what strategy can the United States pursue. So we, we agree liberal international order based on American primacy doesn't work anymore because there are other powers, maybe in China, but uh, also other countries that have uh, agency uh, and the ability to shape part of the outcomes internationally, uh, like Russia, you mentioned India, you talked about Germany and Japan in your book. Uh, so what are, the, what are sort of the alternative ways in which international order could, could be shaped that Americans should be choosing? Well, Ivo, I think um, part of what, what has motivated us here is the idea that the alternatives the American people are often presented with uh, can be wholly unsatisfactory. If you were to listen to the debate as it's often presented in policy literature or on Twitter, you would be led to believe that we have two stark contrasts available to us, one of which is essentially retrenchment, recognition that the United States is somewhat diminished from its post-Cold War position, um, but extending from there the idea that that means Washington should pull back from the world, pursue unilateralist policies, and fail to chart a course for itself that is fundamentally reliant on US leadership and interdependence. On the other side, we see a host of analysts and scholars, many very well intentioned, um, who continue to champion the idea of the United States as essentially still possessing primacy. That is an uncontested global position that means that after a President Trump leaves office, the United States could simply resume its position atop an international order, despite the unbelievable damage that has been wrought. Broadly speaking, these debates often get characterized as as restraint on the one hand and liberal internationalism on the other hand. Um, but we think that these are fundamentally caricatures. That is to say that there are an almost infinite number of grand strategies that the United States could choose from with varying amounts of involvement in the world and ways in which it pursues that involvement. And fundamentally, the grand strategy that the United States should choose should be predicated on how it identifies its interests and how best it chooses to protect protect those interests. Fundamentally, we believe that foreign policy must at its core protect the, pros the prosperity and the national security of the American people. And we see the primary threat to the United States ability to do so as coming in the form of these forces of closure that we've described here. So for us, this strategy of openness is just one form of internationalism that the United States could take up. Frankly, it's a fairly pragmatic form um, that defines its ends um, in rather power political terms, but it seeks means to bring its ends about that are fundamentally internationalist and multilateral um, in their approach. That is, because we see these power shifts as so consequential on the global stage, we believe that geopolitical math means that the United States must remain engaged in the world, must do so alongside allies and partners, and must work through multilateral institutions and regimes if it is to achieve its goals of keeping the American people safe and secure. And if I could just jump in and add to that a bit, I mean, we often think of grand strategies as emerging by design, and Mira has very nicely outlined the two opposing concepts that you often read about and hear about. 
but sometimes they emerge by default. And I think we need to be clear eyed about what the next president, wh whoever wins in November is going to face, which is a four part crisis at home. We have a public health crisis, an economic crisis, a racial justice crisis, and a climate crisis that are all unfolding at the same time. And we'll all be hitting the president's desk whenever he is inaugurated or re-inaugurated in January. So what that does is it presents the risk that the United States will really pursue no grand strategy at all, that it will be so mired in its own domestic crises that it will decline to articulate any affirmative vision for the type of world it seeks to create internationally, and that it will fail to marshal the national resources required in order to exert American leadership, whether in a world of retrenchment or in a world of liberal internationalism, or we hope in a world of openness where the United States is quite globally engaged, but is also very disciplined in the exercise of its power. Uh, certainly, the inbox for the next president is a big one. I'd add a fifth part, uh, crisis to uh, to year four, which is a democracy crisis. Uh, see the headline in today's New York Times to start to wonder what country we live in, and that is an issue that will also have to be resolved. Which is under only underscores the point: how likely is it that a president is going to be able to marshal the, the necessary energy and perspective uh, uh, for dealing with foreign policy? Uh, uh, the, the argument would be, well, you can't, you can't do any of these crises uh, without uh, attacking the international schools as well. So, so to, let's, let's, let's focus on, uh, on what you guys think we should be doing. Uh, the open, uh, open world, we've talked already about it, but what do you really mean by this open world? How does it differ from uh, the, the liberal international order that existed before, and also, uh, this idea, which is prominent in other circles, that we are really in, into this next phase of a very new conflict between democracies, which by definition are open, and autocracies, which by definition are not open, and that we really uh, are, are, are coming into a democratic versus authoritarian kind of world, and that's the new division. It's really what the administration is doing with regard to China and the CCP, and painting this as a as a black and white, open, closed system. But that's not what we're really talking about. So uh, I want to give you the opportunity to, to make the distinction. Uh, in, in ways that you, uh, talk about. Great. Well, let me start off by telling you a little bit more about what the openness strategy is. And then I'll kick it to Mira and let her go into how it's different from the sort of rigidly defined authoritarianism versus democracy sort of showdown that um, some others might propagate or advocate for. So an openness strategy is a new foreign policy vision that allows the US to defend its most important and most vital interest and values, even though it's not the world's sole superpower in the ways that we've just discussed. And it recognizes that the US can only stay safe, secure, and prosperous in a world in which states interact with each other on the principles of openness and transparency. So that means first that all states should be able to make free and independent political choices without foreign interference in their domestic political processes or decision making processes and without outright domination by more powerful states. It means second that international waterways, airspace and outer space should remain open and accessible for commercial and military transit which in practice means that countries like China cannot be allowed to close off vital international waterways like the South China Seas. And third, it argues that global cooperation and global trade should proceed through international institutions that are governed transparently and modernized for 21st century challenges. So to realize these three pillars of an open world, the US does not need to dominate the world militarily. And this is an important point of departure from the presumption that has guided American grand strategy for much of the post-Cold -war, post War period, which is this idea that the US does need to be the world's sole superpower, does need to enjoy economic and military primacy in order to achieve its ends overseas. Our strategy explicitly recognizes that the United States is not that kind of superpower anymore and is not going to be in the decades to come, and we need to adapt to that reality. But that doesn't mean that we need to convince Russia or China or any other great power to accept openness. 
it only means that we need to prevent them from achieving closure. And the United States can do this, but it can't do it on its own. So that's why it needs to work closely alongside like-minded allies and partners to build a powerful coalition for international openness. But that coalition is different than the type of coalition that um, some other strategists would advocate for. So I'll, I'll kick it over to Mira and let her describe how it's different from these sort of free world strategies. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, Evo, further to your great question, um, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about how openness departs from prior conceptions of liberal universalism before digging into this question of how this is different from other strategies that might sound similar. First, the key difference um, but beyond what Rebecca has already outlined is the fact that we acknowledge, albeit heavy heartedly, uh, that the universalism that pervaded American liberal internationalism in the post-Cold War period has at least been set on the back burner. That is, the aspiration that liberal principles and democratic systems would prevail inexorably is not a goal that will be met in the near term. Rather, that we will have to devise strategies and foreign policies that allow us to live alongside strong authoritarian competitors like China, and that we will not have the tools at our disposal necessarily to change the character of their regimes. Those questions will be up to the Chinese people and other people living in authoritarian countries. Um, although obviously we have a preference for democracy ourselves. So that is a notable departure that ultimately makes US aims a bit more disciplined um, than what we saw in the immediate post-Cold War period. Um, but that brings us to the question of how this departs from other strategies that might emphasize the differences in openness and closure in terms of democracies versus authoritarianism. That is strategies that might seek to lock arms only with democratic allies against authoritarian competitors. Openness is a little bit different than that. Number one, because as I've already mentioned, the fact that it acknowledges the problematic fact of having to live alongside a stronger China and other authoritarian competitors for some time to come. But a corollary to that fact is that when and if countries like China are willing to participate in international governance according to open principles, the United States is willing to work with them. That is to say that if China will take an open approach to the future of climate change and continue to make commitments in an augmented Paris Agreement, or even would agree to govern its own Belt and Road Initiative through open principles, the United States should consider working with even countries like China. Uh, but another reason that openness departs from some other strategies that you hear that pit uh, coalitions along regime type is that it recognizes that some countries might choose openness even though they're not perfectly democratic systems themselves. That is, international order in years to come will fundamentally be a patchwork variegated proposition that is ordered differently according to region and function um, with some regimes that unite us all globally. And that in all of these patchwork areas, we may in fact be able to make common cause with countries who are not themselves democracies. I'm thinking, for example, of Vietnam um, that often pursues economic policies that cut in favor of openness, even though it is a single party state or Singapore, not a democracy, uh, but whose preferences align with the United States and its partners in so many of these areas. So by keeping our ranks open to those who are willing to support principles of transparent, open governance internationally, we fundamentally believe that we'll be able to prevail by building the coalitions that are big and robust enough to keep the world open over this very long haul, while countries like China and Russia continue to buy for closure. So uh, we're going to open up uh, to, to the public uh, who are asking questions. And if you want to ask a question, go to ccga.live and we will get to it in a minute. But I, I wanted to put two propositions on the table that I think uh, are underlying the assumption of your argument. One is that we do live in a world in which um, the use of force, particularly among great powers, is exceedingly unlikely. And, and, and I would argue that at least we should think about the proposition that in fact, the use of force between great powers is more likely today than at any time since 1945. And so how would that, uh, if, if that were the case, or, or go talk about that proposition, but the, the use of force is not much part of, the, of your argument. There's an assumption that somehow great power wars is a thing of the past, uh, and we don't have to really worry about that so much. 
the second presumption, and, and maybe one, Rebecca, that, the first one can go to you, and the second one to, to Mira, is a view of China that is not benign, but it is not as malign as we see in sometimes in the speeches that we, uh, that Mike Pompeo has given with regard to its global uh, 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 attempts. You talk about the regional hegemony that China is trying to establish in Asia, but its global in insistence is less. And is that really the case? Or talk a little bit about that. So is war, is war over? Is John Mueller right? We don't have to worry about that anymore. And is China uh, a, a moldable uh, uh, partner that uh, in some ways we don't have to worry about what the CCP uh, things in the way? How, do, how should I look about it? So I, I'll start with the uh, great power war question since you directed it to me and then I'll let Mira take the China piece. I would say that great power war is exceedingly unlikely but not impossible. And the reason that it's unlikely is, well, we haven't seen any great power war since 1945. And that is supported by the fact of nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence, which have made great power war so costly as to be perhaps prohibitive. But it's not just nuclear weapons. We've also seen the emergence of a pretty dense set of international norms against the uh, use of military force that violate the sovereignty of independent states. And also, we've seen significant gains to be accrued through interdependence and globalization. So whereas it used to be the case that great powers could gain economic heft or industrial capacity by dominating their adjacent states or you know, invading their neighbors, that's simply not necessary anymore in a world of globalization where those same states can benefit from the industrial power of their neighbors without directly annexing them. So that's a reason why we think openness is more attainable now than it was in the past. But that being said, great power war is certainly not impossible, which is why an openness strategy requires that we maintain deterrence. This does not wish away the uh, need to maintain a uh, military and in particular a uh, coalition of militaries, the United States together with allies and partners that make it prohibitively costly for a country like China to pursue territorial expansion via the use of violence and uh, military force. Now, that being said, the fact that military force is less usable now than it was in the past places increasing emphasis on other instruments of national power, which will become much more important in the future, economic power, commercial power, technological power. And that's why so much of our book focuses on the ways in which international competition and great power competition in the decades to come won't be primarily military in nature, but will happen as the United States and China compete to set the rules for cyber cyberspace, for internet governance, for AI and the use of emerging technologies, why it's so important that the U.S. lead in setting new rules for the international trade regime so that countries like China can't use illegal subsidies to exploit American openness. So this is a comprehensive picture. Yes, military power and military force do remain important, but American foreign policy has been vastly over militarized over the past several decades. And so to meet the actual challenges that we will face in the future, including from a more powerful China, we need to reorient. We need to expand and strengthen our diplomatic toolkit and our intelligence toolkit so that it's actually equal to the variegated challenges that will be required to compete with China and to affirmatively build a new international order that reflects power realities and technological realities that will be with us for quite a long time. I'll jump in here on the China piece before we move to questions of the audit from the audience. Um, I'll just note before digging in uh, both on the China question and, and the great power war question, because I do think they're actually related, that this strategy of openness is actually centrally motivated by China. Um, we see China as the primary force for closure in the international system, because it is the country with both the demonstrated capability and the will. Uh, to potentially close off pieces of the global commons, close off information spaces, or dominate a region in the form of Asia. Um, so this is a, a pretty uh, strongly focused on China strategy, even though we may seem a bit different in the tone and tenor we take to China, um, particularly if one compares that to the current administration. 
Um, first, on this question of great power war, first, I'll just elaborate briefly on Rebecca's answer by noting that while we do see it as extremely unlikely that there will be a great power war, and obviously we hope there will not be, part of what the openness strategy is doing is laying out clear markers for the United States about what it should be willing to fight for if those things were in jeopardy. Namely, that if Asia were to be dominated by a hostile hegemon in the form of China, or if international waters were to be closed off by China, those would be things so serious for American interests that Washington should consider a use of force, despite all of the countervailing reasons Rebecca laid out why the use of force has become so costly in the post-1945 period. So we do leave room for the fact that that could happen, even though we are overwhelmingly hopeful that deterrence um, and other forms of national security tools will prevail. Um, but second, on the question of our broader stance towards China, these geopolitical shifts that we've been talking about here fundamentally mean that the United States requires more discipline in its policy towards China than perhaps it has imbued in its foreign policy for these last couple of decades. That is to say, China as a matter of sheer economic and military size is a far greater competitor than the Soviet Union ever was. So the idea that we're going to be able to stamp out Chinese influence around the globe everywhere it springs is just not realistic. Instead, what we're doing here is, again, trying to lay out the metrics for actions and behaviors like China that would be by China that would be so fundamentally threatening to the United States and its allies that they would be forced to act and indeed laying out a proactive strategy for the United States and its allies so that they don't have to wait until China takes those steps towards closure. So fundamentally, the idea of keeping an international system is op open is predicated on the idea that China could close it off and that if the United States did, not only would that be a fundamental threat to its vital interests, but that the use of force could happen too late to even protect those interests. And we're hoping to advance this proactive strategy now, in part through building these new forms of international order, so we won't have to face that choice. Great. Uh, so let me let me go to, to uh, some of the questions. And, and one really goes to the core uh, of, uh, of your argument is it, uh, the question of how detrimental it really actually would be to American security and prosperity if the U.S. were to retrench, withdraw within its own borders. Isn't it time that China and Russia take the burden uh, and responsibilities of global leadership? Let us worry about what we need to worry about. We can redirect more of our investment on social and, and economic issues at home. We, the crisis, and I'm, I'm adding here, the crisis has really shown we've got some big problems here at home, uh, and the resources should be directed there and, and rather than uh, the continued global role that the United States actually in historically in only a small part of its period has played since 1945 uh, and 1917, 1918 uh, in some ways, but really go back and, and take care of itself and its own people. It's a terrific question uh, from the questioner. Thank you. I'll jump in on this one, and I'm sure um, Rebecca will want to embroider. Um, we couldn't agree more that fundamentally the foundations of American strength and competitiveness must come from domestic investment. In fact, um, if you pick up a copy of the book, you'll find that about 50% of our policy prescriptions are actually focused domestically. And that is because we believe that the United States cannot compete with China and cannot build these new forms of international order if it continues to be in the flailing state that we see today. Part of what we're experiencing in this COVID crisis is a crisis of state capacity. That is a country that remains powerful by many measures, but is vastly underperforming its capabilities because of the domestic dysfunction and various forms of underinvestment that we discuss more in the book. So what we really want to see is the United States start by reinvesting in itself in the form of education, immigration, uh, research and development and prioritization um, of innovation and science, all of which will fundamentally allow the United States to be the 21st century great power it should be. And fundamentally, that is the country that will then go on to be able to compete with China and build these new forms of international order. But contrary to what the questioner suggested, we don't think it's acceptable for the United States to retrench and to leave burdens to China and Russia to carry for themselves, because we don't believe that Moscow and Beijing have showed any interest in providing global public goods or supporting 
an international order that would be consistent with our interests or our values. Rather, we believe that in the United States absence, absence and I think this has been demonstrated during the COVID crisis itself, China and Russia will continue to exploit the vacuum will potentially use force, coercion, um, and other forms of bullying to get their way, will not reinvest in an international system that keeps us prosperous and secure, and indeed will exploit whatever remaining forms of openness we and other open societies choose to exhibit. Uh, so to our mind, this need to both reinvest in America domestically and reinvest in the international order are two sides of the same coin. They're not alternatives, and they both fundamentally come back to the question of what will keep the United States secure and prosperous. Uh, great. Uh, I think that uh, that gets and, and I do and, and I agree that there's a lot of emphasis on uh, on the domestic sources of American power and the domestic renewal uh, that uh, in, in the book. And there's another issue that you don't find in most international relations sort of global strategy books, which is an emphasis on the private sector. And there's a question about that. Uh, so I want to give you an, an opportunity to talk about it, which is what's the role of multinational corporations or the private sector in your landscape? They have assets that are extraordinary. They're larger than the GDP of many countries. Now, this veers in a different direction. They lobby extensively, often for their benefit at the expense of a local population. But talk a little bit about how to harness uh, the private sector in this and, and perhaps redirect it in a more productive uh, way as part of your uh, grand strategy and, and a strategic strategy of openness. So harnessing America's private sector and also the private sectors of key allies and partners is an absolutely central part of this strategy. We argue that the US needs to take a new approach to public private partnerships as a really critical force to pursue openness globally. And in the book, we focus in the first instance on the United States domestic innovation base, its technology sector which itself is a tremendous engine of growth and innovation and productivity, but it has become increasingly decoupled from the national interest and from the common good. And the reasons that we explain for that are in many cases the fault of the federal government. It's not because the tech sector has politics or values that are fundamentally at odds with national values and interests. It's because the federal government has chronically underinvested in research and development and basic science in the post-Cold War period in such a way that has left the tech sector to pursue profits and incentives overseas, in overseas markets in places like China. So one key way that the US can poise itself to act in a way that is equal to its own power at home is to recouple the tech sector with the national interest, beginning with some game-changing strategic investments that the federal government can make in R&D and basic science in areas like quantum computing, AI, 5G. But 5G is an interesting example, and I think it shows how the private sector can be leveraged in a broader way, too, to advance openness globally. Even as the United States over the past four years has attempted to convince allies not to accept Huawei built Chinese 5G digital networks, it hasn't always offered viable alternatives that are acceptable to the United States from a security perspective. So one thing the US can do is leverage its own private sector, leverage the private sectors of its allies, and leverage the private sectors of associated partners like Sweden and Finland to pool together in a 5G initiative that would together create a competitor to Huawei that does give countries a secure and economically viable alternative. So the private sector is absolutely crucial. It also appears in the way that we think about a potential alternative to China's Belt and Road Initiative and the way in which the US needs to leverage its export import bank and private investment corporation to incentivize American companies to go do development projects in uh, the Western hemisphere in Africa. So that again, there is competition and there's market diversity so that countries don't have to choose Chinese projects by default and can choose American or American allied backed projects. Um, so all of this is a critical part of this picture and also a way in which the openness strategy can become self-sustaining in some ways to try to overcome some of the wild partisan volatility that Mira talked about at the beginning by really achieving buy-in from a much broader swath of the American public and the American corporate 
uh, corporate arena than we've seen in the past. Of course, that doesn't mean that the U.S. needs to prioritize co co corporations above all, and our trade agreements in the future need to reflect a fine balance between corporations and workers. But in general, the U.S. does need to leverage its massive engine of innovation and productivity at home for the national interest. We're almost out of time. We only got one more minute. But let me, uh, one other question, Mira, particularly to you, is, is our alliances have been uh, affected by the past four years uh, and, and need to be rebuilt. How do we build them? But more importantly, uh, the question asks, where should we concentrate our effort first and foremost when it comes to rebuilding alliances? Evo, it's, it's such an essential question. It's a topic I've, I've loved discussing uh, with you in recent months and, and on which you're absolutely second to none. Unfortunately, I don't think the United States has the luxury of choosing um, which alliances it will rebuild. Part of what we have been discussing over the course of uh, this really wonderful hour together is the fact that so many of the global problems and threats we face are in fact global. Whereas once upon a time, the United States had two uh, notably distinct alliance systems, one in Europe, and that is, of course, NATO, and one in Asia, a system of bilateral pacts. So many of the threats we're talking about here come in the forms of the national security implications of new technology or in cybersecurity or in the form of global pandemics and climate change. And when it comes to being able to combat those threats alongside combating the threats posed by a stronger China, allies in Europe and Asia actually increasingly share interests. And if we are to be able to meet the tasks in front of us, we're going to need to be able to pool all of these allies in the service of protecting them. So the United States needs to redouble its commitment to NATO. It needs to redouble its commitment to its treaty allies in Asia, um, of course, in the form of its bilateral pacts. And perhaps even more importantly, it needs to create the structures and the incentives for these allies to increasingly work together. That will not only allow the United States to address some of these newer challenges that we've been talking about, but it will ultimately help to make the alliance system more resilient, whether that is to protect against another unpredictable American leader, a demagogue that is elected in another country, or frankly, just insulate us from the volatility of this period and the massive changes to international order that we're all experiencing. If the United States has allies on its side, it can remain mighty for years, if not decades more to come. But as with so much else in foreign policy, we are at a critical moment. And the failure to choose this commitment to redoubling uh, our efforts with allies is fundamentally going to determine whether or not we succeed in this openness quest on the way forward. Mira, uh, Rebecca, uh, we could go on for hours. Uh, terrific uh, discussion. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, for all of you uh, listening, uh, we've been talking about uh, the book, an Open World, How America Can Win the Contest of the 21st Century. It's a terrific book, quick read. You can get it at the bookseller. Uh, uh, Rebecca, uh, Mira, thanks for joining us and look forward to continuing the discussion in many other places about these important questions about how the United States can remain engaged in the world. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you, Evo. Thanks, Evo. Great to see you.